Welcome to the 2021 Candidates Forum, sponsored by the Wallingford Community Women in conjunction with Wallingford Government Media. I'm Jean McFarland, the program moderator. This segment features the candidates running for mayor. The format will be as follows. The first part of the program will consist of questions asked of the candidates by two reporters from the Record Journal. They are Lauren Takora's reporter for Wallingford and Carla Santos, reporter for the Latino Communities Reporting Lab. The second part will allow each candidate to make a closing statement. During the question and answer period of the program, each candidate will have two minutes to respond to a question. The opposing candidate will be allowed one minute for rebuttal. To conclude the program, each candidate will have three minutes to make closing remarks. Prior to the program, a flip of the coin determined the order of questioning and Mr. Dickinson will go first. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Connell will go first. Before beginning the questioning, I'd like to introduce the candidates running for mayor. They are William W. Dickinson, Republican, Riley O'Connell, Democrat. Lauren Takoras, will you ask your first question of Riley O'Connell? Hi. Hi, Lauren. There have been two council budgets in a row that the mayor has vetoed, and the town still seems to have a lot of money left over. Where do you see room for improvement in the budget creation process? Well, thank you for that question, Lauren. I think there's a lot of room for improvement in that process. I fully support the town council's decision. I was actually a big advocate for it when it was happening, overturning the mayoral veto for those two budgets. And it's unfortunate because one of the biggest responsibility, if not the single biggest responsibility of anyone who fills the role of mayor is passing the budget. Um, but I think it speaks to what the needs of the town really were, the fact that even a Republican, not just majority council, but overwhelming majority council, still had the votes to overturn that veto. The way that I would improve that whole process is it shouldn't be happening in just a few months right before the budget needs to be passed. It should start much sooner and with a lot more coordination with the town council. Now, it's weird that what we've done as a town over you know, 38 years having the same mayor is, and we see this sometimes even in letters to the editor in the record journal, you know, we started capitalizing the word mayor. You know, the way the Constitution's written in this country, the reason that we don't capitalize words like president and mayor because it shouldn't be one person making all these decisions. And that's why I've pushed for a town charter revision, hopefully in the near future, to bring a lot of the powers that the town council used to have back into their hands. I mean, we're paying the town council to sit up here. They should have a say, they're elected officials, they should have a say, a bigger say in my opinion, uh, in what goes on. Because those were the first two budgets in a very long time, sorry, vetoes, in a very long time that the town council had the votes to overturn. Because we do seven votes to overturn a veto in this town, which still boggles my mind, instead of six, which is the constitutional standard of two thirds. So there's a lot of improvement to happen overall, but the biggest thing with the budget, in terms of the process of the budget, not the budget itself, is just incorporating the town council in more. Mr. Dickinson? Yes, I'll, I'll speak to two things. One is uh, if anyone's dissatisfied with whether the mayor has some kind of dictatorial authority, obviously two, two budgets uh, were vetoed and, and overridden. Um, so the system works. Uh, the second question, though, deals with what is in the interest of the community? This town used to be a triple A, now it's a double A one. Uh, you have to look at exactly what is seen as sound finances by auditors, the credit rating agencies, et cetera. Wallingford is not a rich community. We are less than half of the per capita income across the state. So for us to have a high credit rating is an achievement in itself. Um, I'm a firm believer that the trust of the people is earned by maintaining as high a financial standard as possible. And they benefit from that, and I think the community 
financially benefits from that. So that is the mission I pursue. Thank you. Carla Santos, will you please ask your question of William Dickinson? There have been two council budgets in a row that the major has vetoed, and the town still seems to have a lot of money left over. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm asking the same question. When creating the town budget, how do you plan to ensure enough school system funding so that the academic and social emotional needs of students to, who come from other countries and don't have English as a first language are met? Well, I believe, I, I believe uh, your question is how do we make sure we have enough money uh, in the education budget? Well, clearly we, we pay careful attention to what the uh, education budget requests. Uh, currently, uh, the town spends 64 plus percent of its annual budget on the public education. So we take it very seriously. Um, we, we go through their budget, which is painstakingly put together. Then there's a question of what the grants, what grants are available. That facet of the, of the uh, budget is, is reviewed. And then a, a final figure is, is presented. Typically, when the Board of Education deals with the education budget, it appears higher. However, at that time, we do not have the final figures on the health insurance and some other uh, matters that require funding. When those figures come in, then the budget is reduced, but that occurs with the council and the mayor. The Board of Education typically does not have that information. Uh, it's a complicated process, but everyone is, is uh, given attention, and I believe that we are funding public education in a very fair manner. Mr. O'Connell. Well, something we just need to address directly is a more big picture part of that question is just overall the quality of Wallingford Public Schools. You know, we once had one of the best, it was once one of the best places to get an education in Connecticut. And the report recently came out, and this is not new, it's several years in a row now, that we're one of the lower ranked bottom half in terms of educations in this state. And when that happens, it affects non-native speakers, which our community is, which is great that we're having an influx of that population, but it affects them even more. You know, He's doing well now, so he won't mind me bringing this up, but one of my best friends growing up in this town grew up speaking Spanish and English, and because early on in the education system it didn't support that, and he couldn't get through the Spanglish period when he was a kid trying to develop social skills in the classroom in kindergarten and first grade, by high school, even though his mother was a native speaker, he was failing Spanish. I mean, that's an example of us failing our students by not having the ability to adapt and keep up with the needs of the community. Thank you. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Mr. O'Connell? In response to a shortfall in the fire department replacement pay account over the past several years, fire and emergency services were reduced and outside training was cut in order to direct the funding into the replacement pay account. Combined with the decline in volunteerism and in people entering into the career side of fire service, how can we keep the fire department sufficiently staffed? That's a really good question. And I don't want to steal too much uh, from candidate Bruce Conroy, who's running for town council, who answered this very well before. But we can do a lot better job of bringing, like he said, people in, essentially young adults, and even when they're still students, working their way into the system and having, giving them the training options and the volunteer opportunities to go into those career paths. Now, early on in the campaign, I actually reached out, well actually they reached out to me, many members and former members of our volunteer fire department because it's been a struggle. Not just, when you think about how much of a struggle it's been, you know, keeping that department operating as is, it's been an extra struggle for the people that are actually volunteering their time and committing really their lives to this cause. So, and you're gonna hear me say this a lot tonight, there needs to be a better line of communication between not just employees of the town, but volunteers of the town, you know, really critical, essential workers in this town, 
they need to have a better line of communication directly, not just to the mayor's office, but to the administration in general. Because they directly told me they feel strongly that their needs and their wants as employees of the town or volunteers of the town are being completely ignored. And it's a real shame because our volunteer fire department historically is a great program. And we want to keep those, you know, those entities that we have in town operating because we are always at risk of losing them. So we just want to make sure we're giving, like I said, these important, really extra important members of the community an open ear so that we can address all they're asking. Thank you. Mr. Dickinson. Yes, the challenge is well known. Uh, the current budget, uh, the, the fire department budget did go up in uh, spending and $100,000 of that approximately is for the training and the gear for volunteers. So I think it was something like 68,000 for uh, training. Uh, it costs money in order to have fire, firefighter one or the emergency uh, EMT training. Um, they will not have to front that money. The town will pay for the money pay the money for them to be trained and the gear that they need to be able to participate. So we're hoping that that will have a positive effect in encouraging more young people, volunteers to be active. Carla, would you please ask the next question of Mr. Dickinson? The police department has many open officer positions. Is the town paying officers enough Is that my question? I, yes. yes. I, I'm sorry, can you read the question again? The police department has many uh, officer positions that are open. Is the town uh, paying officers enough money? Yes, <clears throat> we, we do have openings and there are a variety of reasons for it. Um, but we, in terms of the funding, this past year, uh, the union contract was approved and provided uh, a general wage increase, but it also provided a sum of money that brought them up to the level of other departments. Uh, so a survey was done. We discovered that we had fallen behind. So there was, a, again, a wage increase that include, included money to bring them up uh, in general to same hourly wage and then a general wage increase on top of that. So that was addressed in that way. Uh, I think with, with the pandemic and, and some other factors, um, there is more difficulty in attracting people to uh, the work that a police officer does. A police officer is very much involved with citizens every day, face to face. It's confrontational and more and more people are reluctant, I believe, to choose that as a career, which is unfortunate. We'll continue to work hard to attract the qualified people and we'll keep, continue to keep Wallingford safe. Mr. O'Connell. Well, this is a really common problem that we're seeing across town departments in which we're really having, well, I don't know if we're having trouble filling the positions so much as we're not doing what we need to do to fill those positions. And the police department is one of those examples. We had this issue with staffing well before the pandemic happened. I'm not saying that didn't you know, exacerbate the problem, but it didn't create it. And that's an important distinction. There's always plenty of people across the state entering the police academy and looking for police department jobs, and lots of them can't find any. So I really don't think it's an issue so much of not enough people wanting to be police officers. It's more of an issue of the fact that across the board, generally, Wallingford doesn't either offer the benefits from a mismanaged pension fund, uh, we don't necessarily offer the same salaries, and when it comes to the police department, our police department generally is under-resourced. It's not that long ago that they had to go to the Wallingford Library to carry some of their investigations. I don't expect them to have the technology that I did at the Department of Justice, but we gotta adapt for modern law enforcement's needs. Thank you. Carla, would you please ask the next question of Mr. O'Connell. The past year has seen a significant turnover of town staff at the highest levels. Is the town doing enough to attract talent to work at the top levels of Wallingford government? 100% no. We're not. I mean, like you said, we've lost, 
I'm going to miss plenty here, I'm sure, because in the past year it's been a lot. Uh, comptroller, superintendent, animal control officer, um, fire chief, police chief, and here's the real key here. The vast majority of those positions and those people, they didn't retire. They left Wallingford to go work elsewhere, where they'll make more money, maybe they'll be treated with a different kind of respect. Wallingford is no longer the attractive place to work for these highest department levels as it once was. You know, I think there's a lot we need, well, I think there's a lot whoever sits in the position of mayor needs to do to develop stronger relationships there so that we're actually meeting, it's a teamwork dynamic, right? We're actually helping these department heads meet the needs of their departments to then meet the needs of the community. I don't think there's as much back and forth currently as there, as there really needs to be. And for a lot of these positions, you know, we're not, it's not even that we're not attracting the right fo or enough folks to apply and everything else. I mean, if you look at all the new positions we had, and I'm all for promoting within, but I think it tells you something when we're not necessarily even getting candidates from outside looking to move to Wallingford. I mean, that is really concerning in itself when a lot of these positions, if done well, pay for themselves, right? There are certain, I mean, think of all the times, all the bid waivers we had to, uh, the town council had to sign off on over the past six months because we didn't have a comptroller. We didn't have a comptroller for four months, which was seven months after the previous comptroller said he was leaving. And even then, we promoted from within, which I'm, I'm confident the new comptroller is going to do a great job. But if we knew we were going to promote him, why didn't we do that four months earlier? We don't have a deputy comptroller now, and we still don't have a treasurer after four years. I mean, the, the hiring across the board, but especially at the top of departments, desperately needs to be addressed. And the only person who could do that is the mayor. Mr. Dickinson? Yes, I can tell you for a fact that almost all of the people who left were either directly or indirectly affected by health issues. So uh, it's, it's not true that people just want to leave. Um, the, other, the other facet of this is that, uh, well, the, the comment that bid waivers are caused by the controller not being there, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, bid waivers are approved, they're presented and hopefully approved as a result of they're having dip, being difficulties with regard to bidding. So a department, not the controller, the, a department needs to buy something, needs to invest in something, whatever it might be, and they find that there's only one entity that would bid, or there are other proprietary issues. So it's, it's, it's not the controller that, that is the active element in bid waivers. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Mr. Dickinson? Staying on the topic of town employment, should the government access TV director position be funded full-time, part-time, or eliminated? Well, currently the uh, government television director is, is not filled. Uh, currently there is no plan to fill that position. That could occur sometime in the future. We have talented people who are providing the service, uh, televising, um, we don't, we are not doing the producing of programming that was a prime responsibility of the director. Um, they're just mainly because of the pandemic, uh, getting people together to have a session in a studio and, and be uh, recording uh, a special program. That, that type of activity has just not been pursued. So to fill a position and not have the work that is supposed to be performed by that position uh, is just not warranted. We have found that the individuals who are doing the work now are talented, capable. We're, we seem to be very efficient in providing the uh, televising that is needed. And uh, I have had no complaints about the quality of our broadcasts. So at this time, we will save the money and uh, continue with the, with the approach that we've adopted. Mr. O'Connell. I completely disagree. I think it absolutely needs to be a full-time position. You know, one of the biggest issues that the town council candidates bring out all the time and the town council members bring up here is a lack of transparency in this town government. And when you, you know, it was debatable whether or not we, or whether or not we were even going to be able to put on this event tonight. 
in terms of the live stream without the same staff that we used to have. And if you actually talk to the folks that work in that department, they need the help. You know, when I was away in college, and when I was working in DC, the way I was able to stay up to date in what's going on in my town was by watching the live streams or the recordings of all the town meetings. We don't even do some of them anymore. I mean, ever since we lost this position, we don't record or at least distribute the EDC meetings. Those are incredibly important. So there is an impact, and it's a really damaging one. And if anything, I think COVID showed us how important it is to have these opportunities because not everyone feels comfortable coming here in an environment like this. And who knows what we'll have next in terms of the next pandemic and everything else. So there's a lot better we can do, and it's a really important position to fill. Carla, will you ask the next question of Mr. O'Connell? The proposed data centers have raised concerns from neighbors about noise and vibration. Last time the town had a similar issue with business and noise at Thurston Foods, the town changed the law. What do you see as a solution to accommodate the data centers and appease the neighbors? Well, that's a really good question. And while from the start, I've been in favor of the opportunity that the data centers present. Also from the start, ever since this became you know, public knowledge, this proposal, I've had a real problem with the process that we followed, or I guess haven't followed, over the course of this becoming an opportunity. For the most part, not only was the public, and still, to some extent, the public has been continued to left out of the conversation, at least until very late along in the process, even the town council members weren't incorporated in a way that they should have been, and I'm sure the mayor will disagree, but that's the reality of it. There's certain town council members that are welcomed in and there's others that aren't. And that's just not a productive way to run any town. The big thing about the data centers, especially with any pilot payment in lieu of taxes program like this, where there's so much up to negotiations within that contract, is making sure you do everything, to, everything you can to protect, protect the neighbors in that area. So for instance, yeah, the town already has sound ordinances, but the state, did not include a vibration ordinance or vibration statute with that data center bill. What Wallingford can do, and I've not heard anything from the mayor's office about whether or not they want to pursue this route, but it's absolutely necessary. We need to pass a town ordinance, at least as regards to the data center, to limit the vibrations as well. We need to check every box to make sure we're not leaving residents of our town, many of them generations long residents of our town, vulnerable to being hurt by these centers. Like I said, overall, the amount of money we can get from these centers and the fact that they're less disruptive than other industries that can go in that area, I'm not in favor of ever telling a private landowner, like these farm owners, that no, they can't sell their land because the town doesn't want them to. That's not our responsibility as a local government. But we need to make sure we have experts in the room that are actually negotiating on the town's behalf. Because Len Fasano is not representing the town in this case, he's doing his job representing his client but the town Thank needs you. to do its job. Thank you. Mr. Dickinson? Yes, uh, well, the, the host agreement that was approved by the council, that was uh, discussed uh, by certainly executive branch as well as the legislative branch uh, personnel, that includes a requirement that there be the hiring of an expert at the point a data center is actually going to move in a sound expert must come in and do a study to determine the ambient noise levels, uh, do a thorough study ahead of time. Uh, once that's completed, that study then will be compared to what happens after the, after the construction begins. And to the extent that the construction does not meet the requirements, which include vibrations, we already have that language and not only not only is it in the host agreement, it's also in a proposed uh, planning and zoning regulation. At that point, then things have to be corrected. Thank you. Lauren, will you please ask the next question of Mr. Dickinson? Let's assume that the data centers are successfully built. Everyone's happy with the noise situation. What do you want to do with the extra revenue? Well, the first thing I'd do would be to hire a uh, director for our television. No, I, to be serious, that's money that hopefully can reduce um, mill rates. Um, 
it, it hopefully will be money that can restore some of the reserves that I think should be there but are not at this point. And certainly there are capital projects that uh, would also be subject of attention uh, for the money. But I think we have to keep in mind the 32 megawatt building will pay something like 1.5 million. Uh, you don't, every building then amasses more and more funds. The chance of all of them going in at one time is, is probably very remote. So it will be a gradual process, should it occur, of additional buildings going in. I don't think we will see an enormous amount of money suddenly pouring into the town. Um, should that happen, I, I would certainly advocate a very careful, methodical, and um, uh, slow process of deciding how to use those funds, but certainly keeping in mind uh, reductions in mill rates would always be appreciated. Mr. O'Connell. I think it's really important to look at record here as opposed to potentially words we're hearing now. Because over the past 12 years, our general fund has increased about $10 million. Every single one of those years, the mayor has also, including the three years prior to that, has proposed a tax increase, a mill rate increase. So the idea that all of a sudden now that we have a new source of revenue, that it's not just going to go straight into the general fund, into the rainy day fund, under the current mayor, I just find hard to believe. I mean, if it wasn't for the town council stepping in these past two budgets, we would have had higher taxes again. So what I would like to do with that money is reinvest it in the community, which we should be doing and should have been doing already with, the, with portions of the general fund for capital expenditures bonding over a period of time. And the nice part about this money is we're not getting it all at once. You know, every year, depending on the number of buildings, we're getting large sums of money in this payment of taxes, plus extra money going through our electric division. So this is a time when we progress as a town as opposed to as wait. Lauren, would you ask the next question of Mr. O'Connell? Advertising in parks keeps coming up and keeps getting deferred. Are you in favor of putting ads in parks? Yes. In short answer, yes. Obviously, any ads that are, and I know this has been mentioned before, but it's important that potentially pose a risk to children, pose a risk to anybody, or just not seemly for some reason or another in a way that's already, there's precedent for, right? I know, and I've heard the mayor's arguments before, as well as some other town council's argument on this, is that once you open the door to advertising, well, you can't stop anyone from advertising. You could have, you know, someone advertising cigarettes on there. Well, that's just not true. That's not how the law works. There's a reason that you no longer see cigarette commercials on the television when you're watching baseball. You know, because you can, when it directly infringes upon the safety or well-being of others, you can step in. So the fact that we have here, not just, a, and here's what's not talked about enough, not only is it a great opportunity for the town to get more revenue, where I really see it being a benefit is it's a great opportunity for local businesses to make themselves known, to get out there in the community and, and be more promoted. And especially in the past year that we've just had, and look, Wallingford's been in a troubling economic decline for quite some time. But after this past year, we've lost a lot of businesses. We need to do everything we can and start being more creative and innovative on how we can promote Wallingford businesses and promote Wallingford as a whole if we want to be in a better place tomorrow than we were yesterday or certainly were, than where we are today. So. In short, I'm definitely in favor of adding advertising to the locations that have been talked about previously at town council meetings, just with the proper oversight, which, again, I think the town council is more than capable of determining. The whole slippery slope argument is, <laughs> I don't think it's a very helpful argument in any circumstance. Mr. Dickinson? I, I think uh, there are some very real problems, uh, one of which is the First Amendment. Uh, I don't think there is the freedom to just decide, well, this one can advertise and that one can't. Uh, it's true with tobacco, there are limitations at law because of the Im impact on, on youth and, and health in general. But uh, there are many subjects I don't think most people in town would want to see advertised on a uh, fence for a little league or another sport. And I'm not, I, I'm, I don't believe that under, under the 
First Amendment and the right to speak, we, we would be able to pick and choose. The second thing is I know the leagues are troubled because they have sponsors. And to the extent those sponsors who pay for their T-shirts and, and you know they, they become uh, part of the team almost, those sponsors are not going to be willing to sponsor the team if they can buy advertising. So I think their fear is they could lose money and then the money from the... Thank you. Carla, will you ask the next question of Mr. Dickinson? How do you plan on creating better relationships with the growing Latino population so that they feel that they are also belonging to the town? Well, the, the uh, Spanish community of Wallingford has been a wonderful example of uh, working of local government and, and people who live in, in the community to provide education, to provide resources, and uh, allow people to become com comfortable living, living in Wallingford. Uh, actually, uh, the grants that are received through the Spanish community of Wallingford really come through the town. That has been in the past. Some new grants have been added that go directly to uh, SCOW, if you will, but um, that, that was an outreach by the town in the beginning. And I think there's been a wonderful effort to include uh, SCOW programming in a lot of our celebratory activities. The uh, mariachi dancers and, and the musicians have been part of Celebrate Wallingford, and uh, they, they've been on many occasions uh, they performed for uh, Red Ribbon Week, uh, I think the year before last, and were a wonderful addition to a uh, reminder to all of us of, of how to constructively spend your time uh, learning dances, learning music, learning languages, and uh, not in making bad decisions. Red Ribbon is about staying away from drugs, alcohol, et cetera. Um, it, they've been a wonderful part of the community, making it a special place. Um, Maria Harlow, who was director of SCOW, is now head of United Way. And she is just the most warm individual you will ever want to meet and an example of how uh, the SCOW community and Maria and so many people are now fully part of what we call Wallingford and the region in general. Mr. O'Connell. You know, Wallingford's got a really alarming issue that we're currently dealing with, and that's with the most recent census, our town had a 15% decline in the number of young people and young families that live here. 15% in just 10 years. I mean, that is scary. And the only reason that number wasn't 20% or close to 30% was thanks to the great influx of the Latinx community moving to Wallingford. I mean, even just over the course of my lifetime, we've seen Wallingford change in, in the best way possible. The problem is, even though we now have a more diverse community, that diversity isn't reflected in representation as you move up through careers and certainly elected positions in government in town. You know, even though we have a very diverse student body, for instance, our teaching force, and I realize the Board of Ed is working on this, but our teaching force is not nearly as represented as the rest of the student body. And that makes it difficult, especially for really young people who want a role model that maybe looks like them or can relate to them more closely. And so those are the kind of things that we need to be performing better. Um, and just, uh, yeah, things like that. Thank you. Lauren, would you ask the next question of Mr. O'Connell? A lot of people say we should offer incentives to attract business, business to town, yet the implementation of the town center zone and the incentive housing zone downtown did not yield that huge uptick in development. What should we be doing differently? It's a great question, and I think, if I'm remembering correctly, I don't know if anyone has taken up those incentive offers, at least very few. Um, in terms of businesses, which I'm glad that we're looking into these, because like I said, we have to be creative. You know, I'm glad the EDC is trying to be innovative in terms of how we attract businesses here, but we gotta try something new if after years of having these, these opportunities, no one's taking us up on them. So we gotta continue to adapt. I think the biggest thing that we're missing as a town, which isn't an incentive per se, but it's just being at the table through online marketing primarily. You know, Wallingford, already has every foundation for what should be, and a long time ago was, the economic, economic epicenter of the suburbs of Connecticut. You know, most affordable and reliable energy in the state. All this open space and storefronts to move into. You know, 
vibrant, beautiful community. But whether you're a small business or big, even 20 years ago, the first place you would look was the internet to see where you had the best opportunity to start your business. Today in 2021, it's the only place, the only place businesses look, and Wallingford is so far behind. And again, I imagine the mayor may disagree on me with this, but it's true. The best thing the EDC did recently was hire a group of Quinnipiac students to kind of develop not our online marketing per se, but our online presence, social media, everything else, which again is a great first step, but this should have been done at least a decade ago. And now also they were just part time and now they're gone and we're not doing anything again. So we're just not, we're doing ourselves an incredible disservice by not putting ourselves at the table, which is why we see our grand list isn't anywhere near what it once was. In general, we lost a lot of businesses that we're not really in a position to replace currently over this past crazy year, albeit, but still, it's not new, it's not a new trend. It was just exacerbated by this year. So we've got to do ourselves a better job and actually promote ourselves. Reach out and, and do our best to bring businesses here because we have so much to offer and they don't know we exist. Mr. Dickinson? Yes, uh, Economic Development Commission uh, did initiate a uh, marketing campaign using social media and that is functioning. I mean, they, they cleverly used some young people, uh, paid them actually, in order to, uh, it went to a couple of the schools, universities, they put together a program and they're optimistic that it will work well. So it's, it's not over and done, it's just beginning. Um, secondly, I, I'd have to say, I don't think we can say whether incentive housing zone or some of the overlay zones have worked or not. Uh, you know, we, we have fallen into this pandemic almost immediately. And even in spite of that, all of the new uh, apartments, the condominiums were built on Parker Street, which is part of that area and close to the railroad station. So I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's as negative uh, as, as it has been portrayed, and I think there's a lot of hope. Thank you. Carla, will you ask the next question of Mr. Dickinson? When it comes to the community pool, as it was bid two years ago, now would be more expensive due to inflation and COVID disruption. What plan do you see yourself supporting? I couldn't hear your last. So when it comes to the community pool, as it was bid two years ago, now it would be more expensive due to inflation and COVID disruption. What plan do you see yourself supporting? What plan? I'm sorry. What plan? Well, I've, I've stated before, I think we need, we need to have the pand a pandemic behind us. Uh, if it does return, that's the last place we would encourage people to congregate. Uh, without mask, and I don't picture too many people going to a pool with masks on. So we need to have that behind us, and then we'll we'll deal with uh, rebidding and determine uh, what what is uh, affordable and not. Uh, the The price came in at almost two million dollars above what we expected when it was last bid. We were we were looking for five million. It came in at six point eight million dollars. So you know, hopefully. Uh, we can get the, the issues of, of the pandemic and illness behind us, and uh, with that, an outdoor activity that encourages people to be together and splash in the water is a wonderful asset. Mr. O'Connell? I can't think of a single time in which we've deferred or delayed a project and that it saved us money. I really, I don't care how far you go back, there's just, it's just never happened. And I don't see, it doesn't matter how long we wait and how long this pandemic goes on, I don't see that original proposal ever dipping below 10 million at this point, or at least not much below. Certainly not what we were gonna get it for before. Community pool is extremely important. I mean, it fits into that really alarming statistic I shared earlier, that 15% decline in young people. You know, I grew up learning how to swim there. I also was my first job in high school as being a lifeguard there. And we're just really, again, doing ourselves a huge disservice by just letting it deteriorate into a mosquito farm, which is what it is now. Let me be very clear. That pool will never open again under the current administration. I just don't see it happening. If this administration was around in 1953, that pool wouldn't have been built in the first place. You know, that pool was extremely attractive to young families, brought young families here, and was symbolic of a town that cared about young families. And now it's, it's gone, and it will come back if I'm elected. 
Carla, would you ask the next question of Mr. O'Connell? Climate change is a reality that we are experiencing. Although many policies are set at the state and national level, what initiatives would you implement at the local level to help the Wellingford community adapt to a changing climate and use town resources sustainably? That's a great question. And, and for context, my background actually academically was in environmental studies and, and law. And part of that was because I saw, as many people my age did, the issues we were already starting to feel the consequences of with climate change. And Wallingford is in a really unique, in a good way, situation here where we can actually respond more proactively to energy situations, for instance, than other towns can, given the fact that we do own our own electric division. Now, even though, and this has been debated before, we don't produce our own power, we still own one of the power plants. So in terms of expanding it, which is certainly going to have to happen to some capacity, we have to expand energy coming to the town significantly if we do go with the, through with the data centers. Well, that's an opportunity to decide how we're going to expand our energy creation, right? We have, the federal government made, has made it very clear across administrations that by 2035, I believe the year was, it's no longer going to be economically viable or frankly with federal statutes possible to have non-carbon neutral or non-close to carbon neutral energy producing plants. So we could do what this administ well, what this town's done for decades and that's just put a band-aid on the problem and, you know, build to what the restrictions are now or we can actually look ahead, you know, 5, 10, 20 years to be ahead of the curve so we're not completely shut down and lose our electric our own electric division potentially in a few generations or in a generation in a generation. Specifically where we can start, which is a common sense place to start, are our schools. We have huge buildings with no tree coverage on a flat roof where you can just put solar panels. You don't have to worry about the intermittency problem that you know plagues most most renewable energies because the schools are used during the day primarily. That's a great opportunity where we can help our board of ed be more energy efficient and just be better for the overall carbon footprint of the town. And there's plenty of things like that. There's the solar farm that's private that could have been public, that could have been ours uh, at the old dump. So we need a progress like that. Thank you. Mr. Dickinson? Yes, in, in terms of the environment, a million five hundred thousand dollars is spent or available every year in order to provide uh, energy audits and uh, assist in buying uh, lighting uh, fixtures motors, machines, appliances that meet higher energy standards. So that is one way that we are participating in that, that issue. Uh, however, the reality is that our electric rates are low enough that solar panels do not work in Wallingford. Uh, the big trouble with the solar panel and wind approach is that in New England, it's only about 24% of the time that especially solar panels are effective. The result is because you can't store the power. There, there isn't the development of batteries to store the power. The result is the grid's base power is still going to have to depend upon fossil fuels. Thank you. Lauren, would you ask the next question of Mr. Dickinson? Last month, the Planning and Zoning Commission rejected a plan to build an Amazon facility on the former Bristol-Myers Squibb property. This was the second attempt to build a warehouse facility on that site. What should replace the town's largest taxpayer? Well, from my perspective, uh, I think a big problem with the uses being proposed uh, is the seven-day-a-week 24-hour-a-day schedule that is involved. Bristol-Myers was a big presence there, lots of traffic, but it was nine to five, five days a week. So what's being proposed legitimately causes people concern about the amount of traffic, noise, et cetera. And that has been generally the, the proposals that we have received uh, for use of the property. Now, the property is ideal for industrial commercial development. It's right on 91. That's why that's part of the Research Parkway Industrial Park area. And, you know, I, I think it should continue to be marketed and encourage a business that would not have that kind of impact. Again, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. 
we, um, the other facet of this, of course, is that office space is no longer, at this point, uh, viable. Uh, people working at home, uh, no one is looking for office space, which, which creates an additional issue over what uses can go into the property. But I believe there are our issues, our, our uses, and with the planning and zoning changes being pursued, would allow a variety of other uses uh, in harmony with the new regulations with the watershed protection. But uh, that those new regulations need to be adopted. Mr. O'Connell. You know, I, I really do sympathize with the decision that the planning and zoning, it was a tough decision that they had to make. And ultimately, look, I mean, obviously if we had a magic wand, we would have loved to keep Bristol Myers, which just wasn't feasible. And in terms of, you no, know, I agree with the mayor actually on this, we need to market the space. The problem is, like I said before, we're not doing a great job with marketing in general. We're marketing as if it's still the 1980s. It's just not enough. And this is what I'm talking about in terms of where you can put your money. It's not free to, online, to do online marketing effectively, but these are things that pay for themselves when done properly. The rate of returns is insanely quick. So Amazon wasn't the best fit for that spot and the traffic really would have inconvenienced a lot of residents in the area. And more importantly, Amazon really doesn't have nearly as much economic value to bring the town as a lot of other potential businesses that go there. But what we can't continue to have is just an empty, beautiful space. So hopefully we'll find a new, new tenant soon. Thank you. Carla, will you ask the next question of Mr. O'Connell? There's a small but growing movement in Vermont, Massachusetts, and New York to allow non-citizens to vote in local elections, arguing that non-citizens who are taxpayers deserve a say in who represents them. What's the best way to ensure that the voices of non-citizens who are members of the Wallingford community are heard by lawmakers and elected officials? That's a really interesting question. You know, I honestly didn't know that those ideas were being pursued in other states. And it's a really interesting prospect, especially in a town like Wallingford, where we do have a growing community that isn't necessarily originally from the US and, and might not under normal circumstances be able to participate in the process. So since I'm just hearing of it now, I'm not exactly sure where I fall on it, but the reality is what, we're, what we need to do is, we, whether it's voting or another process, we need to find a way to make sure that these members of our community, because they are important members of our community, you know, I know many of them, and we need to find a way that their voices are still being heard in some way, shape, or form. Because a lot of the times, I mean, we saw this when, I know I brought the census earlier, but I'm just talking about the process of the census being carried out, carried out we saw scare tactics across the country. I mean, I was working in D.C. at the time, which you know, had a very diverse population, where you know, people that didn't necessarily have the proper documentation were being told or threatened, essentially, that they shouldn't be filling out the census, which is completely counterintuitive to what the census is. You are supposed to fill it out regardless of your citizenship status. So um, we just need to find, you know, it reminds me of when I studied abroad in New Zealand many years ago, where the way the process they have there was actually, as long as you're a resident with, for three months or something, you can vote in any of their national and local elections. Now, I didn't because it was a presidential election year in the US, and I wanted to vote in that, and didn't feel like I could probably vote in, in both, obviously. Um, but it's a really interesting thing, because it does allow, you know, keep in mind, when I was, I was at a university town, it allowed all these university students to have a big say in what they wanted their town that they spend you know, at least four years in to look like, so it is important. Um, and I hope we can find whether it's this or another creative solution to bring in all sorts of different residents of our town together to make sure their voices are heard. I think that's a great conversation to have. Mr. Dickinson? Yes, uh, I, I believe that what is being pursued would require a change in federal law. And we do have a duty to follow law in this country. And uh, short of the law changing, I don't believe that there would be a right for someone who is not a citizen to vote. Now, we should and do provide services to allow citizens, people living here, to become citizens. The adult education program as an active program, and, and every year we, we are inviting, we have invited 
people who have successfully passed all the tests and they become United States citizens. I think there were three or four at the la last year at the graduation. So there, there is a need to follow law, and if the law changes for the, for the pertinent laws, I think that's great, but it needs to follow a process that is logical and accepted that we change laws in a peaceful way. Thank you. Lauren, would you please ask the last question of the night of Mr. Dickinson? Yes. Um, you mentioned the proposed changes in the watershed protection area. How do you balance the pros of profitable development, business success, and a broadened tax base with the cons of potential pollution of the town's drinking water, residential harm to quality of life, reduced farmland, and open space? Well, I. I it, Real balancing doesn't have to occur. You just do not choose pollution and uh, harm to the ability to people have clean water. Uh, you just don't. Uh, a very uh, intense process was just pursued by our water division, planning and zoning staff, and our town engineer reviewing those regulations and determining, uh, and the law department, and determining what would be the best approach. And they've arrived at an overlay zone that protects the water shed for the Muddy River, which flows through the area uh, on the east side, and that river becomes the sole, sole source, basically, of the water that goes into McKenzie River uh, Reservoir, which then gets pumped to the Ulbricht reservoir that gets pumped to the Pistapog, so it's, for our surface water, an extremely important stream, uh, class AA. So they spent a lot of time. The water division is extremely uh, possessive and militant about not exposing their water resource to harm. Uh, I believe they did a very thorough job, and it, it needs to be looked at very carefully, it certainly can be altered, but there's no, there's no turning, there's no saying, oh, well, if we can get $30 million, then, you know, a little bit of pollution is okay. No, it's not, it, that's not, we, we don't want any pollution, and we're trying to achieve a way of protecting the water and allowing for uh, economic development. Mr. O'Connell? Yeah, well, it's definitely, I think, more complicated than just not doing any business that could potentially harm our water. I mean, if we went by that standard, we wouldn't be able to drive cars in 90% of Wallingford. So it's always a balance. And it's not just, yes, first and foremost, I mean, I live right on McKenzie Reservoir. And like I said, my background is in this environmental law. So it's, it's really important to me, as it, should to, as it should be to all residents, that we do everything we can to ensure that our, not just our water, but our farmland, our nature in general, like Tyler Mill, is preserved in the best way possible, while still not, you know, making it possible for economic growth. I think we also need to be smart about, not just for the sake of polluting these, um, you know, watershed areas, but also in terms of building, we've got to be smarter. I mean, think at Lyman Hall, their first week of the school year this year, not only did they have all these half days for heat, they had a whole day of school canceled for flooding because that school, which is one of the oldest school buildings in the state, was built on a swamp. So we as a town need to be better about where and how we build in regards to these conservation rules. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer portion of the program. Each candidate will now have three minutes to make a closing statement. Mr. O'Connell, will you please begin? I'd love to. Thank you. You know, I can't overstate how critical conversations like the one we had tonight are for a healthy democracy. It's important, especially because I realize that you know, even though I've been campaigning for the better part of a year, for some people, this might have been your first time getting to hear me verbalize exactly what the details of my plan are. And I want that word to really, let's hone in on it, the word plan. Because in less than two weeks, you all have to decide between the two of us who's laid forward a better plan or potentially any plan for going forward as a town. I think as voters, we're tasked with having to think really critically here and think to ourselves, is there any metric, any metric whatsoever 
that would show that Wallingford's doing better today than we were 15 years ago? Because I, I can't think of any. I already mentioned the 15% population decline. That is incredibly alarming. But also, 38 years ago, Mayor Dickinson inherited one of the lowest tax rates in the state. And now we're not even in the top 70 lowest tax rates. I know he's running on promising low taxes, but I think record speaks louder here. We've had 16, keep in mind, two recessions over that period of time, 16 consecutive years of proposed tax increases. I mean, that is devastating. At the same time, Wallingford once used to have one of the best places to get an education in the state of Connecticut as well. We're ranked in the bottom half of the state of Connecticut now. I mean, that's not just embarrassing, that is unacceptable. And that, this has to be a wake-up call because we're running out of time. Don't, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't be running if I didn't, despite all these issues, think Wallingford is a great, fantastic community. But it's also a town that's been struggling, that's been trending in the wrong direction for far too long. You know, yes, in a very literal sense, you'll all be casting your ballots for either me or Mayor Dickinson, but this election is so much bigger than that. This election you know, is a referendum. It's a referendum on community pool, our schools, our taxes, technology, the animal shelter. I mean, it's a, it's a referendum on common sense, in my opinion. And that's why from day one, my campaign slogan has, be, has been for our future. Because in no uncertain terms, this election is a referendum on our future. So voters have a really important decision to make. I don't think it's a terribly difficult decision, in my opinion, but it's an important one. And that's, do you want a Wallingford that's trapped, essentially content with being trapped in the diminishing shadow of its former glory? Or do you want a Wallingford that actually looks forward, looks to the future, and aspires to be something and restore integrity and ambition to our town hall? Because that's going to take a lot of work. And I hope the last 38 years have been painfully obvious. And if not those, then the last Thank tonight, that, uh, that only one Thank candidate you. up here is willing to do that work. Mr. Dickinson, will you please make your statement? Yes, I'm proud of Wallingford. We are the envy of many other communities. Often they don't want to say that, but I know it's true. We have so much to be proud of. Just the way we approached this pandemic, our health department produced a teamwork that involved Masonic Hospital, Gaylord Hospital, All Necks, Choate Rosemary Hall, all providing staff so that some of the first vaccine clinics in the state were held right here. I don't think our schools are failing. I think our schools are great places to learn. I think it's been difficult during the pandemic. Remote learning is a real challenge. But I know they are looking to provide the extra tutoring, the programs after school, so that those who are not at grade level will come back to grade level. We owe it to them. We owe it to our society. We owe it to ourselves. We are initiating a new police station, safety on our streets. People tell me, you know, I feel safe walking around in Wallingford. That's incredible when you read what's going on many places. So we need a new police station. The ARPA funds, there's going to be a challenge. All this money to be divided up. Well, the first place it should be addressed is those who have lost money due to the pandemic, the businesses that closed. That's the first place to help them get back on their feet. That's what's Wallingford about. We care. We care for one another. Is everything perfect? No. We wouldn't, none of us would have to be here if it was all perfect. But we're solid. We have been, we'll continue to be. I look at it this way, Wallingford. Safe and sound an ever-solid, smiling hometown. That's where we live. That's what we dedicate ourselves to. That is the goal. I'm running for mayor. Yeah, some say, oh, he's been in too long. Well, I don't think so. I've got ideas, I've got energy, and I want to devote it to making Wallingford an even better place. 
So thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight. Thank you. This concludes the mayoral segment of the 2021 Candidates Forum. On behalf of the Wallingford community women, I thank you for watching and remind you to please vote on November 2nd. Have a good night.